Good morning. My name is Christine Diaria, and I'm one of the assistant directors at the Derek Box Center's Learning Lab, and I'm joined with Esther this morning. We're very excited to kick off our session, Leveraging Technologies to Give Everyone a Voice, with just a quick poll, which you are all doing. So that's amazing. We were hoping to start this with kind of a demonstration of ways to get live feedback from folks, and you jumped right in. So as you can see, our first question for you is, what are the challenges of participating in the classroom? And there's so many great responses here. Esther, when we see a word that's bigger, what does that mean? That means more people have entered in that word. So we can start to see trends and understand where audience perspectives are at within this question. And we can see that there's a lot of overlap in these areas of participation, anxiety, fear, safety, cultural, holding space. These are awesome ways to kind of get started and think about the kind of feelings that students show up to um, with the classroom. Yeah. Fear and anxiety on the part of the students or the I think it could be maybe all of the above. That's a great question. Do you have a feeling about this? What's your intuition? I just want to clarify. Yeah. <laughs> oh, can, can we do a quick show of hands? Uh, everyone, even if you didn't enter fear, we'd love for you to participate. How, if, raise your hand if you think fear on behalf of students is a challenge. Ooh, lots of hands. All right. Fear on behalf of faculty. Ooh, so many of the same hands. Yeah, yeah, I think it's all of the above. That's great. All right, should we move to our next question? So many challenges of participation. Why is it important to you for all students to be able to voice their perspectives, questions, insights, et cetera, in the classroom? So take 30 seconds to type in something. And this is a short answer question, so you don't need to restrict yourself to one word. Yeah, this is great. And is anyone having any challenges participating through the poll? Okay, great. So we have peer learning, active learning, diversity of viewpoints, um, stronger learning outcomes, a range of perspectives, right? These are all of the things that we want to have as kind of our vibrant learning communities here to broaden perspectives. That's a great one. It's very important. And must hear all points of view. This is great. And we can share these after the session with everyone um, so we can see. So thank you so much for participating just quickly in this exercise. We want to leave plenty of time for our amazing faculty presenters. But this is just a way, again, to think about the ways that we can leverage technology. Um, so I want to turn it over to Esther, maybe, to get us started. Perfect. Thank you. So our agenda today, icebreakers, you all nailed it. That was awesome. Give it up. Give yourselves a round of applause. Ice has been broken. Are we figure skaters in here? All right. Next, we're going to go through some introductions. We wouldn't be great instructors if we didn't have some learning objectives for today's session to share with you all. Then we have some incredible faculty speakers right here in front. Everybody give it up for our faculty. And then we're going to do a small little think pair share, just my favorite thing in the world. Before we go any further, I always feel it's very important that we have a land and people acknowledgement. Um, we are here today at Harvard University, which is the traditional and ancestral lands of the Massachusetts, which are the original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. And uh, the uh, Harvard University Native American program wrote this statement uh, to pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past, present, and future, and to honor the land which remains sacred. And now we're going to introduce ourselves. Hi, all. If you can't tell by my pink hair, my name's Esther. Um, I work at the medical school. I'm the associate director of teaching and learning technologies. I am a five foot tall, white passing queer woman with an invisible disability. And I'm wearing a green shirt with alpacas on it. 
And as I said, my name's Christine, and I am a white woman with medium length brown hair. I used to have very long hair. I'm still getting used to my hair being short. And I'm wearing glasses and a plaid shirt. Thank you. We are modeling today in an effort to show transparent teaching methods, ways that you can model inclusion in the classroom by using things like a land and people acknowledgement, by sharing a visual description for maybe those um, uh, who, who, who require one for accessibility. These are all ways that you as an instructor uh, can help build a, a sense of safety and a, of psychological safety within the classroom that really enables students to be able to answer these really tough, difficult questions. Uh, our theme today is all about dialogue and being mindful. And as the instructor in the space or support staff, we can help build those in by the behaviors that we do at the start of the classroom. So we are gonna hear from our fantastic faculty about the methods and technologies that they're using to do this exact thing. So I'm gonna pass it back over to read the learning objectives and then we'll dive right in. So I'll just go through these really quickly, but essentially today's session is about reflecting on the importance of including all students' perspectives in the classroom and considering the barriers that exist for them to, to do so. Um, our faculty panelists are going to share with us some of the existing technologies that you can use to gather um, student perspectives and share them in real time, among other capabilities. And hopefully in the process, we'll develop those strategies that lower that barrier to entry for students so that they can participate. Um, and in that kind of real-time feedback um, zone, we're kind of thinking about these low-stake uh, assessments of student learning that can take place um, at times. So first up, we're going to hear from Rebecca Nesson and Charles Nesson. Rebecca is the Dean for Academic Programs and Associate Senior Lecturer on Computer Science at the John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Charles Nesson is Weld Professor of Law at Harvard Law School, and they're going to present about threads. Thank you so much. And Thank you so much. Yay. Thank you all for joining us for this. Um, we are going to talk about a technology, but actually really we want to talk about a specific problem and it goes so well with what was up in the word cloud. Um, really the, the thing that we are reflecting on in our teaching, and I'll say a little bit about a class in which we worked on this, is the problem of how to get out into the classrooms thoughts that would be good to share, but that students might choose not to share in the discussion. So um, the idea here is that you're sitting there and within yourself, you have a sort of total freedom of thought. You can think any thought you want with no actual fear of reputational harm or problem happening to you from just thinking it. Some of those thoughts are appropriate to keep to yourself, but some of them you really would benefit from having some discussion of them or others might benefit from hearing them, but they're scary to share. So we try to deal with that in our classes and our groups and our communities by creating really thoughtful class compacts, by developing trust in the classroom, by having getting to know each other, those kinds of things that would make it feel a little safer, safer in the classroom environment to share our thoughts, but it only goes so far. Um, and then there's this additional challenge, which now comes to us often through technology, that those things that we do in the classroom, and we might have a feeling of kind of safety in the classroom, sometimes creep out of the classroom in a way that makes people even more scared of the repercussions of the things that they might say. Um, so the question then is, how can we get those thoughts out into our, our discussions or our, um, our classroom environment in one way or another. So first off, it's helpful to think a little bit about why are we not saying the things that we're thinking. Um, probably the biggest one or a big one is fear of reputational harm, that somebody might think that something that you are going to say is ignorant or, or dumb or offensive or otherwise problematic. Um, you might even have worries about that yourself um, and uh, that might just stop you from doing it because it just doesn't feel like it's worth the risk. 
Um, you may also have some fear of being treated in a biased way. It might be that who you are is going to cause people to interpret the things that you say incorrectly or to undervalue the things that you're saying. And so it's hard to say a particular thing just because of the body that you're in or what the people know about you. And then some people are just not that comfortable um, in the speaking in class environment. Um, I always have in my classes this problem where there are lots of students who know the answers and have something to say, but they don't want to raise their hand when somebody else has already raised their hand because they don't want to be taking over somebody else's chance to talk. So they stay quiet, even though they would be happy to say it if they needed to. Or uh, some people um, just feel like they, they know what they wanted to say, but then when they try to say it, it comes out all wrong. And it's just not that comfortable um, to do it on the spot in a class. So um, in order to address this and work on this, uh, my father developed a software called Threads, a software environment called Threads, which has now transitioned, so some of you may be familiar with it from the past, but it's now transitioned to being called Nimity. And uh, the, the concept of it is that it's a really simple chat-like threaded text-based discussion environment with this, this twist on it that the participants are pseudonymous in the discussion. So you're not identified, you're not associated with your physical self, you are not associated with your name. And it's something that's, it's not a message board in that it's intended to be used live together in a community, in a classroom. Um, and it has the effect of potentially allowing us to take a step away from the fear for, of reputational harm and also some of the other challenges. It's not the only way that you could solve this problem, but it's helpful to just compare it to the affordances of our face-to-face -face classrooms when we think about what the effect might be of actually bringing this technology into your classroom and saying, okay, I want you all to actually open up your laptops and spend a bunch of time in class together staring at your screen. We well, better have a pretty good reason for wanting to do that in class because there's some dangers associated with it. Well, first of all, in NIMSpace, it's pseudonymous. So uh, we'll show it to you in a minute, but it means that you might say something that somebody might think is not actually the most incisive or thoughtful remark, and nobody will ever be able to associate it with you specifically, I mean, within some, some limits. Um, it also is not a place where you have to worry about speaking over someone. People are speaking at the same time, and uh, it's kind of threaded, but simultaneous participation that's happening. So it's easier to put your voice into the conversation without feeling that you're taking the spotlight. Um, and this, I think, sometimes feels uncomfortable to some people who don't spend a lot of their time communicating in text-based environments. But it's actually very comfortable to nearly all of our students um, at this point, and many of us, I guess. Um, and that's also true of this, the communication being text-based. Um, I'll just also note, it, note that it's unmoderated versus moderated. So in terms of the fear as a faculty member, it changes the set of fears as a faculty member. You, as a faculty member, suddenly have the opportunity to step away from your identity and say something in class without the authority of it being the teacher who's saying it, which sometimes is really useful and important to be able to do it. But you also lose a little bit of your control over where the discussion is going to go. Um, I want to stop there. Well, actually, let me do one more slide, and then I want to ask you, Dad, to give some comments, and then we'll show the software. Um, so. We together taught a freshman seminar, um, not last year, but the year before, called We the Jury, um, which was incredibly fun and also really a big challenge. The idea was that we were bringing together 12 students in their very first semester of college and bringing them together as a jury, asking them each week to read up on some prompting materials about a really challenging uh, potentially divisive topic, and then come together in class and deliberate to a verdict on those issues. And then also to have a whole reflective element on what makes a deliberation effective. How do we actually have a deliberative group make good decisions? Um, and a key part of that is making sure that everybody's voice in the group really does get heard. Otherwise, you're losing some of the power of that group that you've brought together. 
So um, what we did is we would start the students in nimity in class. They would come into class and they would first share their impressions and their thoughts in this environment so that they would all be able to see where everybody was starting out and also have some back and forth discussion of it and get a sense of what was safe and what was unsafe. Where were the edges of what people were thinking and feeling? And then only after we'd had that discussion, have everybody um, have deliberations as a whole group or in small groups of six. And um, it was incredibly effective at getting everybody's voice into the discussion and also at getting uh, opinions that they might not have otherwise said. Um, one of the best examples of this turned out to be in a student-led project where the students got to pick a topic that they wanted the group to deliberate. And this, a couple of the students had picked uh, the final clubs. Um, and would the question was, should the final clubs exist and would you join one? And um, the sort of initial everybody chatting before we started conversation made it seem like everybody just thought these were horrible and nobody would ever consider it. But as soon as we got into Nimity, it came out that, no, actually, that was not really true. Lots of the students wanted to go to the parties and maybe join the clubs, even though they had issues with the way that they worked. And we had quite a different discussion because of it. Um, Dad, what would you like to add? I feel like I'm a professor these days of identity. And this starts with identity. It starts with the orientation, the first meeting with students, in which I start with the fact that we, each one of us, started our existence as two strands of DNA from our parents. And we've lived from that point forward in environments that are unique to us from the process through to birth, from the process of birth through to where you're sitting right there now. And your unique start has had an education that's come from your environment, your specific environment, which means that each one of us, as we're sitting here, has a unique state of mind. Each one of us knows what we think is true and what we think is not, what we think is real and what we think is not, what we think is right and what we think is wrong. But each one of us very likely has many differences in the conclusions we've come to because we've come through the specific learning environments in which we've come to be right here. So that first step of thinking about just what's in your head as a private space. All right, and then thinking that beyond that space is a communication of what's in your head to the group. So I, I think of education of the individual identity as starting from like the black dot of inside your own head and extending out through different rhetorical spaces to the other, to a small group, to a class, to a larger class, and ultimately out to the public sphere. And the goal is to become comfortable, to feel present, to be able to be relating to each of those environments and the discourse that's taking place in those environments. So that comes before the tool. That comes before the tool. The first exposure to the tool you can understand as the first step out from your interior space. Do we try it? Yes. I'm not sure we've got the best question for this, but we're trying to put a point on it here. Um, we'd like you to um, take a little minute in your own headspace and see, just as you observe your own thoughts, can you identify the line between the ones that you're willing to say and the ones 
that you're not willing to say. Let's say I asked you all to raise your hands and share a thought. And I, so I thought, we thought maybe something that's common to all of us without a lot of time is that we're all members of this Harvard community. We all see this place as this uh, wonderful and flawed institution and have a lot of opinions about what might happen next. So suppose that you were the person who got to advise Alan Garber on strategy uh, or make the decisions that Alan Garber is making. What are the thoughts or questions that you have about Harvard's future? Uh, and see if you can just think about that in your head for a minute and observe which, what things you would say and not say. Okay, I'm probably stopping you before you've had full time to do it, but you can keep considering it. Um, but I would like you all to take a chance to try to go to tinyurl.com slash Um And I am going to enter in a thread and ask you all to share something that you probably wouldn't share if you were speaking up in the classroom there. But I'd like everybody to wait and do it all at the same time. So load it up, get it into the text box, and then we'll have do it all together. The key is not to post yet. Don't hit the send button until Becca says, hit the button. You'll notice in the upper right-hand corner of your screen that you have a pseudonym. And each one of those is different in the room here. Yep, so mine is Galactic Moon that I just got logging in there. And uh, I think, let's give it a go so we don't take too much time. So when I say go, um, hit enter and we'll see what we've got up there. Go. So you should be able to see this on your own screen and the screen up there. And uh, it's hard for me to scroll through, but it's you can see that it kind of helps will help for yourself to scroll through on your own. Um, Do you want me to pump up the text? Sure, that would be great. Uh, and let's see, I don't know if I'm gonna be good at uh, this. And I'll just show you the tiniest bit about the interface here, um, some of which I won't be able to show you fully because I'm not logged in here. Um, but you can change your pseudonym. And if you log in, you get the ability to create your own threads environments. This is totally free non-commercial, and you can set them up so that students can create threads or so that only the instructor, the owner of it, can create threads. And you can set it up to allow upvoting or not allow upvoting. Um, this particular board doesn't allow you all to create threads just to keep it all tight. Um, but there's lots of ways that you can use it. And what we've done here, obviously, you could just do exactly the same thing in Poll Everywhere. But the concept with threads is that it is actually a discussion. So this isn't perfect for a discussion. There's too many ideas all in there to have a threaded discussion. We'd want those each in separate threads. But this is just so that you all get a chance to touch it and sort of see how simple uh, it is to use. The tiny URL um, is tinyurl.com slash Um And that will get you to this specific thread. It will stay up for 90 days so we can all go and look at these questions, um, which unfortunately we don't have time to actually talk about. Uh, but I can see that there's some really provocative stuff in there, which is awesome, because I know you all wouldn't have said all those things if, if we were just raising our hands. Um, and just one last thing to show you here is that if you just click on the name, um, it will take you to the main uh, uh, page where you can create your own if this is something you want to use in your class. Thinking back to the list of priorities that were up there and thinking that from a teacher's point of view, the tremendous advantage I find in this is that it solves the, the initial hand in the air controlling the environment of the flow of the class. It's like everyone gets to think through what it is their answer is to the question before they've heard anyone else's. And that just is a starting place that leads to very good classes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rebecca and Charles. Our next faculty speaker is going to be Kelly Miller, who is Senior Lecturer in Applied Physics at the Harvard John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences.
Okay, well, thank you, everyone, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, so I'm going to talk about social annotation platforms and the role that they play in enabling um, conversations very similar to, to the ones that were talked about in the, in the last session. Um, so I've divided this very short talk up into three parts. First, I'll talk a little bit just about the technology in general and how it works. And then I'll talk about a specific platform that, um, that I played a role in developing called Perusal. And then we'll talk about how these platforms specifically enable voice. So, so what is a social annotation platform? It's, it's just a piece of software that enables users to collaboratively annotate, highlight, comment, and basically engage with material that the instructor uploads to the platform. So the material is, is typically textbooks or articles or some sort of text. Um, could also be videos um, or podcasts or you know, any other media um, that the instructor wants to share with the class, um, at, normally outside the class. So um, a lot of them have sort of social features that can be um, in, that students can use to engage with, with each other outside of class. Um, the benefits, um, so the, there's been a lot of literature that have, have, have shown that the benefits of social annotation platforms um, are increased engagement so students can participate like offline with each other and with the material. Um, there's, it, they provide a collaborative environment. Um, there are, they've been shown to enhance students' critical thinking and, and ability to sort of analyze text and have a discussion, so like analytical skills and critical thinking skills. Um, they're great for community building because as students are interacting and they can see like who's logged on, I'll show an example uh, when I get to the perusal part, but they're, I mean, it's basically building a community within the context of the, of the course material outside of the class. And then they're also um, have been shown to in, improve inclusive, inclusivity. Um, so there's many different types um, of there's I mean there's a ton of different social annotation platforms. Um, these are just um, the most popular ones that are used mostly in higher ed and high school. Um, and I'm going to talk specifically about Perusal because um, Perusal um, was a is a platform. I don't know how many of you have used or heard of Perusal. Okay, so so quite a few. So Perusal is a platform um, that I. Um, played a role in developing as part of, I did my PhD here in applied physics, and um, I developed it um, with my advice, my PhD advisor, Eric Mazur, and a couple of other people. And it was basically developed to support the out of classroom experience for flipped classes. So the, the types of classes that I teach here at Harvard are all sort of project based. And so this is a platform that we've been using for, I guess, almost nine years. To, um, to, to help students um, engage with material outside of class so that when they come to class, um, they can do sort of higher order critical thinking um, activities and things to develop um, you know, their skills um, in, in more advanced ways. So it's, it's fundamentally a social learning platform. Um, and just in terms of the workflow, so, so instructors, they create assignments in the platform, and, and those assignments center around some form of um, like either a reading, a video, a podcast, something that they want the students to read or, or watch before class. And, um, and then what happens is the student clicks on the assignment, the reading pops up, or if it's a reading, and then you know, they can see who, which other students in the class are logged on to the reading. Um, and then they can highlight text, or if it's a video, they can uh, put a marker on the, uh, the, the progress bar, and it'll uh, prompt a, a text box to open up. And then they can ask uh, questions or make comments or have sort of a conversation in the context of, of that text. Um, and so what happens is, is a conversation or a thread emerges asynchronously at a specific location within the content. Um, there are some features to help students um, 
curate the annotations because I mean you can imagine depending on the size of the class and the length of the of the material that you've posted it can become very cluttered and so sort of organizing the question threads and the explanations in a in a way that makes it useful to students is important so students can um, can indicate that they're asking a question and then um, the through topic modeling the platform organizes the questions topically and then you can sort of see like oh these are the, this is the topic on which a lot of students have asked a question and it'll say like you could, as a student you can click on a question on another student's question and say oh i have that that question too okay, and so it, it just it directs it helps direct um, other students attention towards like a specific part of the text that they might want to focus on um, there's also another feature where you can um, click somebody's explanation and say, oh, this was like, this helped me understand the material. Um, and so you can see like what that looks like in the platform, the little green tick in the, in the middle um, on the right hand side there. Like you can see that, that that particular explanation was like upvoted 34 times. Um, and then another thing the platform does again to sort of like, you know, uh, play on this like social feature is um, when somebody responds to a post um, that you placed in the platform, uh, you get like a nudge or an email notification saying like someone's responded. And this just encourages um, students to go back into the platform and continue to engage in the conversation, like even after they've completed the, uh, the assignment. Um, okay. So in terms of like how do, how do these types of platforms enable voice? Um, there, there have been some uh, research articles that have been published just recently about this. Um, this particular one um, was, a, was a study that was done um, at, I think, Worcester Polytechnic Institute uh, um, across a bunch of courses that were using perusal specifically. And they found, they basically administered a bunch of surveys to, to all of the students who were using the platform. And they tried to understand like how students were engaging with it and to what extent they felt like it improved their learning. And they found uh, specifically for traditionally marginalized students that the platform was, was helpful for engagement, exposure to like multiple perspectives, which I'll talk about in a second, um, supporting, you know, this collaborative kind of cohesive, you know, out of class uh, group experience, and then fostering a sense of inclusion um, within this like out of class environment. So that's some research that's been done specifically on, on uh, traditionally marginalized students. And I just want to talk about three features that I think are intrinsic, not just to perusal, but social annotation platforms in general that I think make this type of technology specifically helpful in, in enabling, you know, vo multiple perspectives and like, you know, encourage students to, 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 sh to share their perspectives. So the, the first is the fact that um, the, these platforms are asynchronous. Right? Like, so students, um, like I know for, for me, um, I, I don't feel comfortable necessarily engaging in small discussion groups because I like to have time to think before I speak. And I, I never liked the environment of like a group of people sitting around a table like discussing a, a text or like I, I, I just don't like that. So I, I, the, the fact that these platforms, you can read it and you can think about it and then you can participate in a discussion asynchronously encourages people like me who are, you know, just don't like the, the real time, like discussion group um, forum. You can still participate in the conversation, but asynchronously. Um, and then these, pl most of these platforms, Perusal, for example, you can anonymize your, like you don't have to respond as Kelly Miller in the forum. You can, you can post anonymously. So again, like it encourages people who don't feel comfortable. I mean, this, you know, I use it in the physics class, so there's not a lot of controversial things that are said, but like I can imagine, you know, in humanities or, you know, social studies that it, the fact that you can anonymize yourself is, um, makes, might make students more uh, willing to participate and, and volunteer sort of less than popular perspectives. Um, the other thing that I think um, enables voice um, with these platforms, at least with perusal, is uh, multiple representations of the content, right? It's not just textbooks. The instructors can share 
videos or podcasts or, you know, um, diet, you know, images. Um, and there's the, the multiple representations like, um, enables learners from, you know, different, different types of learners to engage in the material. Um, and you can also respond, um, either by, by typing or by, uh, recording your voice and po posting recording. So that sort of like multi-modality will encourage like different types of learners to participate. And then finally, um, the, just the fact that when you read a textbook, like when you read just like a static textbook, you're only getting the perspective of the author. Whereas when you participate in a social annotation platform, you're getting the perspective of like all of the people who are participating in that forum. And so I, I think just like, intrinsically these platforms are set up in such a way that multiple perspectives can be shared. And, you know, like you can see with this example, um, this is like an environmental science uh, reading and, you know, the, pr the different people are, are giving their perspectives like from their, you know, from their own like personal point of view. Um, and it's just, you know, they're, they, they're, they're set up in such a way that the multiple perspective is is part is almost becomes part of like the textbook you know you're getting the author but you're also getting all of the other participants in the class perspective and and that you know seeing the various um points of view when you read through the annotations uh, i think makes students more likely to share their perspectives very similar to um to rebecca's presentation and so that's um that's mostly what I wanted to, to tell you about. I don't know if there's time for me to Thank you so much, Kelly. So now we're going to hear from Teddy Cyranos, Senior Lecturer in Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, who's going to be talking about Teachly. Thanks very much. Well, while, uh, I think you're going to bring up the Teachly window, is that right? Yes. Thanks. Hi, everyone. My name is Teddy. Um, oh, I'll use this. I uh, recognize that we only have until 145, so I'm going to try to do this on the on the quicker side. Um, I just wanted the, the framing I want to give before I show you this tool, Teachly, is that I think a lot of interesting, a, a theme that has come up, I think, a lot this morning and also in today's session and a lot of the conversations I had at lunch was the value of sort of removing oneself from a conversation in order to talk about challenging topics, right? So debating ideas and not people, the value of anonymity and being able to express things you might be afraid of. Um, and I think there's really quite a lot of value in that, particularly when talking about difficult uh, uh, things. I see a lot of value in, in the, in the, in the uh, uh, use of anonymity to, to talk about difficult conversations in class. This tool, Teachly, I think takes sort of exactly the opposite approach, that it's useful to lean in to what led us to be who we are and what identities we have in public and uh, the dynamics of particular classroom settings and things along those lines, and to really try to use that to try to have uh, uh, difficult conversations, which again, I do see the value in both sides, but I wanted to, to uh, uh, express this. So Teachly is a tool that um, I developed alongside Dan Levy, who's actually here. Dan, can you wave? That's Dan Levy. And a student, Cardi Supermanian, a former student. And the basic idea is uh, to make it easier and faster to get to know our students and where they're coming from, and then to get to know what's happening in our classroom as it happens so that we can better respond to things like blind spots along, and things along those lines. So this is a, a sample Teachly course that actually does have real student information from students who have consented to letting us share this information. So when you have a Teachly course, students fill in profiles uh, that in which they can share their background, how they identify along various demographic uh, uh, characteristics, their prior education and work experience, what they want to do with the future, some fun facts. These are profiles that are common across Teachly courses. So if they take another course, they can, the same information is shared. We also have the ability to add specific course specific questions. So in my course, I teach statistics. I ask a question about, have you used data in a job previously? And if so, how? And so students can fill that out and then it gets added to their profiles. So the, the, the biggest thing that I think is really useful for having these kinds of conversations in classrooms is simply that you can get to know your students very quickly by browsing their profiles and 
and you can also search. So if I'm going to talk about something controversial, um, maybe charter schools, for example, I might check to see if anyone in my class mentioned education in their profile. And I have a couple of folks, and they come up in the results. And then I can read about their background. This person is named Chris. Um, he was a, a high school teacher in a public charter school. Um, so before we have that conversation, I might reach out to him and say, we're going to be talking about this thing. It'd be interesting to have your perspective on it or things along those lines. So I can come to the classroom potentially prepared for some interesting potential people that I could call on or bring into the conversation through various ways. Once I do that, the other set of, of uh, uh, features that Teachly has is related to participation. And so a thing that happens if you have a teaching assistant or something in the classroom is that they can track participation in the classroom in which you basically have this here seating chart. And as people speak, you just click on their, their face and it kind of logs their participation. You can then do things like, for example, look at a heat map to see who the highest participators are and who the lowest participators are to see if you have blind spots in the classroom for who you're calling on. It looks like there's kind of a cluster of folks here who talk a lot in my class, um, whereas the ones that don't are more sort of evenly spread out. So that can really give you a sense of if there seem to be voices that are not really coming through in the class discussions. And then in order to give uh, faculty sort of a high level look at what's happening in their classrooms, we send a weekly email that summarizes the information in this thing we call the course dashboard, which hopefully gives you some high level sense of what's going on in your classroom. So for example, average attendance rate in the last five classes, how many comments are being made by students per hour, and perhaps these last two are the most useful for trying to have inclusive conversations, is the percent of students in your classroom who have spoken at least once in the course so far. And then sort of flip side of that, what proportion of comments are being made by the top 10% of participators? So is it really being dominated by a few voices, for example? We then have things like student check-in to see if somebody's been missing or absent from classes for a while. And then also to give you a sense of whether there is some uh, uh, potential bias in who's speaking in the classroom, gaps along the lines of the proportion of comments being made by, for example, women, and then the proportion of the classroom who, are, who identifies women, and looking for if there is a potential gap in, in that. So we have two sort of ways of thinking about it. First, to really, I think, dig into people's uh, uh, background information. So for example, if there's a student who hasn't spoken yet, I don't want to just cold, cold call her. I might actually instead click and learn about her background and potentially try to think of ways to bring her into the classroom conversation. And then from a higher level, trying to see if there are any trends in what's happening in the classroom that I could potentially use. I'll leave it there so that we can have some conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're going to open it up to some Q&A from all three of our faculty speakers. If you have a question, please raise your hand and I will run over to you. Oh, awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks so much. Do you want to handle that side of the room and I'll get this side? Uh, sure. Perfect. Hi. Um, I have more of a logistical question about Teachly. So um, is this profile generated from information that they put in like with the school? Like is that auto generated or is it reliant kind of like, like in my head, I'm thinking of like dating profiles, right? Like you get what people put in. And so it's like, is it reliant on students actually actively engaging with filling out their profile? And then do they have to do this per class or do I just create a Teachly profile one time and it goes to every single course? Great. So the, the short answer is they do fill it out themselves and it is shared across courses. So if you fill it out once, it fills out forever. We do think it's important that students fill it out themselves instead of sort of assembling it, for example, from like LinkedIn profiles and stuff, because we do want students to say what they want their faculty to know about them versus not, right? We think that's important. But in a lot of the schools that are using Teachly a lot, like at the Kennedy School um, and School of Public Health, a lot of the times uh, uh, students are filling in Teachly profiles at the beginning of the semester at the Kennedy School as part of orientation. So you do it once and then unless there are additional questions for your professor for your course, that's the only time you ever have to worry about it. Hi, thank you. Um, this is a question about all three tools, actually, which is whether they're undergoing continuous development or whether they are kind of like in their final forms. Um, I know with Teachly specifically, it was designed for in-person 
participation primarily, um, and I'm curious about whether there are like is thought to include additional features for online courses. I'll answer quickly for Teachly and then pass it along. It's still very much in active development, trying to figure out what sort of features would make it more useful to folks. We do have some affordances for, for online learning, but we're working on things, for example, getting a Zoom transcript and then automatically doing participation based on that, for example. Um, so it's very much still in active development. We're just trying to figure out what features would lead it to be more useful to a broader array of course types. Uh, Nimity is also under active development. It's just been redeveloped to its current form, so it's not janky anymore. Um, and it's pretty light on the features, but there's interest in what people want who are using it. Yeah, same same thing with Perusal. Perusal is actively being developed, and new features are being added um, to make it, you know, more flexible and um, applicable in in different, you know, like online versus in person, that kind of thing. Thank you very much for the presentation. Really interesting tools. Uh, my questions go more oriented to the first two tools and the possibility of express anonymous opinions. From the perspective of the teaching teams, because we were talking about fear, how do you moderate a threat anonymously? Because there could be legal implication of what people say there that it could offend other members of the community or the classroom. Yeah, I'll go first. Um, yeah, so so I should have said when I was talking about the anonymous, you know, the fact that students can, at least in the physics context, and I mean, maybe this makes sense, but not very many students do anonymize themselves. Um, the Even if, if students do anonymize themselves, the instructor can always see who um, posted. And there is a, um, this content is inappropriate button that other students can click. And so if there's, if there's um, a comment that's posted and somebody flags it as, as inappropriate or something that makes them feel uncomfortable, then the instructor automatically gets a notification and they can go in and remove it. So like it's, you don't have to be necessarily constantly reading through all of the annotations to make sure there's nothing offensive. It's, it's the kind of thing that other people can flag it. Um, the, the intended use is for Nimity is in the context of a classroom community. And so for us anyway, we would cr spend some time working on developing an understanding within the class of the norms for using it and also of how the students in the class as a whole want to respond if something happens in the live discussion or in the online discussion that makes somebody uncomfortable that uh, has always been sufficient. Um, as the instructor, you can always also take the threads down if something is really, you know, seriously gone wrong, but I'm not aware of that ever happening. I'd say the biggest impediment that I've met in trying to acquaint people with this NIMSpace environment is the fear of anonymity. And it's so deeply rooted in the outside environment that it, it really it pays to appreciate the distinction between the open net where there are trolls and distrust and closed networks. That is, the, the classroom is a closed network and emphasize that you've all signed up for this class, you've all come here, you all recognize all your differences, you all, when you speak out, know that you're speaking to someone in the class and they know that you're in the class. And it leads to a kind of collaboration on being supportive rather than being hostile. Yes, hostilities can come up and yes, they are to be dealt with, but I believe that our mission is to lead students to be able to govern themselves in the different rhetorical environments in which they're on their own rather than being moderated. So for me, the lack of moderation is a feature, not a bug. Okay, thanks. One more question over here. Yeah, I think you were, uh, I'm from uh, School of Education. Um, I think uh, you're getting into it a little bit more, but I see the both benefits of having an anonymity for safety reasons, but also acknowledging identity of students. You both have like different uh, approaches that you took, but like how do you, so could you talk more about the transition of, okay, things happened here, 
but then how do you connect to whether transition from anonymity to acknowledging anonymity and dealing with them or vice versa? So one thing that's really great about the pseudonyms is that it means that the things that people have said in the pseudonymous space are associated with characters, avatars, so that they're present in the room, so that then when you go to have a conversation, the conversation can be in reference to the perspectives that were expressed by a particular participant in the discussion by name. So it's not just all unnamed or, you know, jumbles of numbers. And to me, that's been pretty important is a, then you are in a moderated situation. And if I'm the one starting the discussion, I often want to pick something out out of what was happening in that discussion and start us there. Um, yeah. do, students, do students self identify? I'm the galactic whatever. Really? Sometimes. Oh, cool. Yeah. I'm currently teaching a group of uh, incoming students at the law school in a very similar frame to the, what I did with Rebecca. That is a group of 12 new students. Uh, they uh, initially, first class, uh, answered, what is your passion? And I then divided the class into two groups of six and gave them a jury case to deliberate. Uh, and at the end of their deliberation, asked them if they could identify pseudonyms from the others in their group. So that the whole thing, in a way, became kind of a game and a listening game and uh, a way of meeting. And some were right and some were wrong, and it all winds up with them kind of getting to know each other better. So it was a very good kind of first class, first meeting, and uh, we're ready to go for our second class next week. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you all so much. We are at time. So can we please give it up for our faculty? Woo! Thank you all for your insightful questions. I am giving you all a piece of homework. We didn't have time for the think, pair, share. So I want that to be your homework assignment is to think about how you can take either the theory or the technology, integrate it into your own work. And I'd love for you to email us and tell us about it. So thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your conference and have a beautiful day.